This is PNC Roundtable. Hello, this is Rick DeVore, Regional President for PNC Bank, and thank you for listening to PNC Roundtable. It's on this show that we tackle some of the region's tough issues with people who make a difference. Now here's the PNC Roundtable. Welcome in to the PNC Roundtable. Hi, this is Paul W. Smith, along with Rick DeVore, Regional Vice President, PNC Bank, and we're coming to you today from the 2016 North American International Auto Show, and we're here on the FCA Chrysler stand, and it's a beautiful stand for sure. We're going to talk with Mike Wall, Director of Automotive Analysis of IHS Automotive, and Sam Slaughter. Sam is the Vice Chairman of this 2016 North American International Auto Show. He's also the uh, proprietor of Sellers Buick, GMC, Farmington Hills, Bowman Chevrolet, Clarkston, Sellers Subaru, Macomb Township. It's the Sellers Bowman Auto Group. Gentlemen, nice to have you all here. Rick, it's a beautiful auto show, isn't it? No, it really is, and this is my favorite PNC roundtable every year. Uh, we've been fortunate to have Mike, I think, now five years running, and uh, it's just uncanny what this was maybe in 09 and 10. Oh, boy. <laughs> and what, where we are today, it's really exciting. It is an exciting time in the industry, that's for sure. 2015 wrapped up, Mike, in a fabulous way. Uh, uh, where are we, in your opinion, in the U.S. light vehicle sales cycle? Is there... Is there room for even more growth? Yeah, we do think there is a, a bit more room to run. I mean, I, we're in the later stages of the cycle, you know, uh, the latter innings, if you will, of the game, as it were. But you know, last year we did, I think when all the numbers are counted, probably 17.4, 17.5 million vehicles, U.S. light vehicle sales. We see it growing to 17.8 this year and peaking out at 18.2 next year. So there still is some, uh, there's still some gas left in the tank, if you will. That, that is astonishing. It, to, if we hit 18.2, that'd be just amazing what is the outlook for leasing and and what about uh, used vehicles and used vehicle prices yeah you know when we see uh leasing has been very active last year it, when the numbers again are sorted out we'll probably be pretty close to 30 percent of the market will be leasing and um very attractive lease rates and low finance low interest rate financing obviously helps that enables that as well and you know the used vehicle market has held up quite well used vehicle pricing has held up quite well which helps the new vehicle market as well you get some good substitution there and you know you'll see some pressure on some of the used vehicle pricing as more of these vehicles come off lease and and hit the market but we still see it as a positive for the industry you know as we look further out 2019 2018, 2019, higher interest rates will start to start to maybe weigh a little bit more heavily on the market, and the market will start cycling. It's a cyclical industry, but we still see as a, a very positive outlook for the U.S. market. Music to the ears of anyone in the industry, including Sam Slaughter, who, along with owning these various dealerships I mentioned at the beginning, is the in fact uh, the vice chairman of the 2016 North American International Auto Show. And uh, this show, I, I, you know, these words come easily a lot to say it's the biggest and the best. The fact of the matter is when people come in here, they're going to see this really is the biggest and best. There really is a change this year. Yeah, there, there's a huge change this year. And, uh, you know, we hearken back to the, the 09, uh, 10 years when you really didn't even want to be down here because everybody was in a bad mood. Very Nobody tough. knew what was going to happen. And Very it was tough. hard to be down here. Uh, but if you just look around the show today, we got over 70% of the stands are new, um, which which is just uh, always nice to be fresh and, and on top of that. But the other thing is we've opened up this new Hall A so that uh, the, the traffic pattern works a lot better. And <clears throat> for whatever reason, the manufacturers have, in, in my mind, they've just taken it one step up in elegance. It just it, everything looks that much more uh, refined. Well, we, we are building the best cars ever. We are. Uh, everybody is. And the, uh, the even though there was much uh, made at the end of the year of the, uh, the interest rates going up a little bit, still spectacular interest rates to buy a new vehicle or lease or, right. or whatever. Right. Absolutely. You know, and you think about what real rates are. You know, we would have died for these 15 years ago, right? <laughs> right. But, you know, one uptick and people, I think, shouldn't panic. But, you know, it's interesting. I was going to ask Sam... We uh, we saw a reveal at Eastern Market on Sunday, one of the Buick cars. But you know, obviously that was pretty very exciting, and I'm very excited for Buick really going forward. They have a lot of great products. But what for the person listening, our listeners out there, what else can they expect to see that's going to be maybe new and exciting? You know, a lot of con talk about you know electric vehicles, but what else? That's that in your mind. Well, I, I think uh, you know it's it, interesting. Two years in a row, Buick has kind of had this 
the, the showstopper, if you will. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you even start to see some of the things from the last year's car, the Avenir, in the new lacrosse that's uh, actually going to be in production this summer. So one of the things that I think has evolved over time is that in, in the old days, concept cars were really out there, and you knew that they could never get built. Um, and it took a long time, you know, from, from concept to, okay, on the street, and it always looked worse and all. It never was as good as the concept. Never. No, right. ever. no, yeah. ever. And I think w with, with technology, uh, and I'm not an expert in te not technology, what they tell me is uh, it's a lot faster from concept or near concept to market. And I think that's one of the things that's interesting to me, just looking at the show, um, more technology, uh, more self-assist parking, more, uh, more use of technology throughout the vehicle, um, and also a lot of use of technology to sell the vehicle. If you look at these yeah. driving simulators and the screens that oh, uh, they're yeah, using. Good point. And, I hadn't thought you know, about it, that. So re remember this, okay? So I don't know what year it was, but remember when they used to give you the shopping bag, the plastic bag, yeah. and you used to get all the brochures from yeah. every manufacturer? Yeah. Well, right. that, okay, that we don't do that anymore. Nope. It's all on yeah. a thumb drive or, or whatever. So, <laughs> you know, technology is uh, invading our lives in, in good ways. Yeah, this idea of concept to market, it's, it's so much quicker, both for suppliers and automakers alike, that, yeah, you'll see a few of the kind of high-flying concept cars that maybe show the design mentality theme and methodology and right, theme. Right. But, boy, there are so many more that are dubbed concept that they're pretty darn close to production, uh, and they'll be the ready bolt. to go. The yeah, bolt, great yeah, example. Yeah. Yeah. I have contended that in the old days they did the concept cars as kind of a, an exercise for their designers to have fun and whatever. And then somebody said, you know what? We can't afford to spend millions of dollars on something that's like a, a piece of artwork or sculpture. We can only do concept cars that might make yeah. sense to build. We've got to build we, stuff people yeah. want to buy. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. why spend the money on the stuff that we know we're never going to build? I think that had a lot to do with so, it. So, you know, speaking of that, and going back to the Buick um, concept car, uh, actually, that was a design that two young designers, and when I say young, I mean they look like they're in high school. Uh, <laughs> that, no, 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 nothing bad about them, but they, they look great. But uh, um, they, they won the contest internally, and their design is what ended up being the concept car. Wow. Now, so you're 25, 27 years old, whatever you are, and, and right. you've got that much already in your career. That's pretty cool. I and just want you to know, uh, uh, Sam, with your Sellers Buick GMC, you have a, a vested interest in that Buick. And I tried as much as I could twisting uh, Mark Royce's arm when he was here on our show, on the morning show. I said, you know, if you want to make the announcement, you're actually going to build the car. You yeah. know, you're welcome yeah. to make that yeah. here. Was he close? No. no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, no, I'll say he was close, but close is no cigar, as yeah. we might say. I That's mean, right. The fact of the matter is, I wasn't going to get that from him, no matter how hard I tried. Did, did you tell him you'd buy the first one? Uh no, why didn't well, so I think that of might that? Well, so that tip it over the edge, Yeah, Paul. the first one's always discounted greatly, isn't yeah, absolutely. it? Absolutely. <laughs> I have a personal request of all three of you because my wife has figured out that this whole process of concept usually isn't going to be on the floor. So she's always telling me, you can have one of those. And last year, <laughs> she said that on the Buick. So we should keep that amongst ourselves. Oh, because, yeah. well, that's uh, hilarious. I'll have to tell Mark that I'll be first in line on that uh, one. There you go. That's right. Well, indeed. We, we are seeing a lot of uh, new models. Rick, you saw them just on the walk over here. Oh, absolutely. And I was, uh, you know, wondering, you know, from Mike, you know, what new launches this year? You know, in the old days, uh, you know, growing up like I did in Dearborn, you know, you'd see a completely retooled car every year. And then we got away from that. But it does seem, even though it's subtle, we are seeing some other kind of new and exciting things. Uh, you know, Acura, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, yeah, what they're I mean, doing. There are some really interesting launches coming down the pike, particularly this year. There was a concept, that Acura Precision concept, which is really an interesting design theme design study that's showing their future and kind of where they want to take the brand and i think it's a great idea it looked looked actually uh, really compelling in terms of production launches this year you know we're right in the chrysler booth i'd be remiss to not mention the chrysler pacifica yeah. that is a big launch this year so not all the those, old pacifica is it not the no. old one you know, all those town and country buyers they're going to be in for a, a pleasant awakening i would say when they see that pacifica and all the content in and the design and, 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 and all the features behind that. The Honda Ridgeline is going to be something that we're going to see coming down the pike again. It's a pickup truck. Honda's entering, re-entering that mid-sized pickup truck market. So that'll be uh, certainly interesting to watch and, and see them compete in the pickup truck segment, which is doing phenomenally well. So, so the yeah. Dodge minivan will go away? Eight, yes, eventually. We, we see it continuing through about next year, or into next year. Okay. And then really the Pacifica kind of carries soldiers on and carries the day for the, the 
overarching brand. Okay. It, it sounds like as beautiful uh, to our right, if you're looking at your radio dial right now, left to right on your radio dial, <laughs> uh, to our right is the Viper. And with Sergio being such a realistic guy, he said in so many words, it doesn't make sense to build that car anymore. And we're going to see that more and more. Even though we have the halo effect and what a great vehicle and all of that, if you're not selling enough of them for it to make sense, you got to yeah. say in this day and age, we're not going to do that. I think Sergio has been very uh, savvy about sort of pragmatic capital deployment. I mean, at the end of the day is where do we want to spend our money and mm -hmm. what programs? Uh, the Viper is awesome. It's a halo car. It, it will just blow the doors off of many things. But you're right. At the end of the day, what will drive margin, what will drive volume, what will drive revenue? And uh, no, so I think that's uh, made a lot of sense. It's sad uh, when you think about it with gas prices so low, True. you'd be more... <laughs> able to make the decision to buy what what we would use to call a gas guzzler, a, a car with a massive engine that really doesn't get great fuel economy. Uh, you would say, throw caution to the wind, we can afford it now. With that thought in mind and with reports that gas prices might be down even lower at the pump, what are the ramifications? What sort of impact can we expect, Mike, from the continued collapse in oil and gasoline prices? And Sam, I might ask you on the front line at the dealer uh, area too, what that might mean. But Mike, yeah, it's interesting. It, it it does impact mix. So when you think about the type of vehicles we're selling, larger vehicles, larger crossovers, pickup trucks, some of the smaller subcompact compact cars aren't necessarily selling as well. And it makes sense. Consumers got a little bit more money in their pocket. They want to grow, maybe in segment size or maybe in trim level. That's another fee, which definitely benefits dealers and automakers alike. Suddenly the uh, customers got a little bit extra money and they can stretch a little bit more into that. Um, into that vehicle. So it does impact the, the mix. It also is going to impact us, frankly, too, in terms of CAFE. If right. we think about the technology coming down the pike, in order to hit that 54 and a half miles per gallon down in 2025, um, it's going to be tough when you're running gas at a dollar. Kind of a double edged dollars. sword when you yeah. think Definitely. about it. Yeah, yeah. sure it is. And, and you must see it on the, on the front lines at the dealership level. You know, it's amazing to me how quickly customers respond to a change in fuel prices. You know, you go over three bucks and everybody wants a compact car. You go under two fifty and everybody wants a pickup truck. With and all it, due just, respect, it's a little crazy. It is a little crazy. No, it really. But, is. but I mean, we, we stand there in the show and we shake our heads and it's like, <laughs> don't you realize this number could go the other way? No, uh -uh, no, I want that pickup truck. You know, yeah. so. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we we do talk with customers about, and this is one of the things about the 2025 regulations, if, if the customers aren't going to want to drive vehicles that get that kind of fuel economy, there's there's going to have to be something that, that is done to, yeah. to either incentivize or, you know, new technology. So uh, back to, you know, opposed pistons and, you know, other things that, that, they're, that they're working on that isn't necessarily electric because it's not necessarily proven either, but um, it's, it's hard to get a customer excited about something that they're not excited about. What do, you, what do you guys think of uh, Toyota with that hydrogen car? When I had the uh, pleasure and privilege of going to Japan because of Aishin World Corporation and Toyota, I drove this hydrogen car. I, you don't notice the difference at all. It happens to be a hydrogen car. General Motors talked about it a long time yep. ago and was going to do something with it. It's yep. kind of been dropped here. But what do you think the odds of it uh, coming on strong now with with the fact that we have CAFE requirements due in, in, in this year and in 2025 yeah. and everything else? You know, it's a technological marvel. So I'll first put that, point that out. I mean, what they're doing on the fuel cell, and it's not just Toyota, Honda. I mean, there's a, a wide variety of automakers that are focused on fuel cell. However, you know, when we're talking $2 gas and we're talking about the kind of just large vehicles that are all around us, and more importantly, the, it's the fuel refueling infrastructure. You know, we have roughly, I think it's around 180,000 gas stations around the U.S. That's a lot. That, you can go to literally every corner and pick up gas. You can't do that with, with hydrogen. And, you know, California is the big deployment, and then they only have a handful of stations. So uh, it's something that as we get the, if, if and when we get the infrastructure built out, it is something that um, I think will be sort of that, further on down the line, 2030, 2035, much further down, um, it will get there, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a ways to go yet. It's a ways to go. Yeah. I was uh, kind of curious of both of your opinions of, uh, you know, we have $2.5, $2.6 billion of exposure just in the state of Michigan in the auto industry, not counting dealerships, I may add. We could always use another one. There you go. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, we when we look at what's going on, we try to check ourselves 
as to what platforms and that's why i chess is so important to us because it's one thing if you're providing a product that's only north america but from a global perspective i think you know it's kind of a mixed bag right i mean brazil is completely off the charts and you know russia is affecting europe in a way so i caution some of the consumers that the euphoria might be more of a north american phenomenon i was curious Mike, from your mm -hmm. perspective, and Sam, if uh, you agree with that concern, I know my wife tells me I worry too much. But, um. <laughs> Donna is a good advisor to yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, it, is, it is advisable because when you think about it, it, it is very much a multi-speed type of global environment that we're in because you're absolutely right. Brazil is a, is a train wreck right now. It is. Russia is a very, very challenging market. Uh, China has been this fits and starts. I mean, it's still a high growth market in terms of overall vehicle size, and, and, and we see st certainly growth prospects there, but it is volatile. And it's the volatility internationally that has been a challenge, I think, for a lot of automakers and suppliers alike. Um, I don't want to be too euphoric over the North American market, the U.S. market. I do think there is still some room to run, but I do think growth is starting to slow. And I think the challenge may be, as this growth slows, you're going to have every automaker, and we talked a little bit about it earlier, there's, there does seem to be a little bit more parity in this industry where everybody's got great product. Well, if that's everybody's true. got great product and we've got slower growth, we're going to be chasing that product. And that's when some maybe not so great decisions get made and throwing maybe too many incentives or building too much. I don't think we're there yet, I do, but we right. have to be mindful and yeah, watch for it. we're watching margins really closely. Definitely. It's the PNC Roundtable here at the North American International Auto Show Kobo Center. Mike Wall with us, Director of Automotive Analysis, IHS Automotive. Uh, we're happy to have Sam Slaughter here, Vice Chairman of the 2016 North American International Auto Show and uh, the uh, owner of the Sellers Bowman Auto Group. And uh, I, you don't want to get too euphoric about what's going on, Mike, and I appreciate that, but I'm going to be real euphoric about what's <laughs> going on and the impact that this auto show has Definitely. on not just the automotive uh, industry, obviously, but on this entire region. Uh, an auto show like this one has a tremendous economic impact. Talk a little bit about all the positive things about this auto show. And I'm not even talking about the charity preview that has raised millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars for children's charities within the sound of my voice and in this area. Talk to me a little bit about it, Sam. Well, I, I, <laughs> excuse me, I completely agree with you. It, there's, there is a euphoria about this show uh, somebody told me the other day it, it's sort of like having a Super Bowl in our city every year. <laughs> it is. Uh, in terms of it economic is. impact. And we and, shouldn't take it for that. granted. No, it is like it, having no, a Super right. Bowl every no. year. And we were, we were talking with one of the suppliers yesterday, and, and their comment was, you know, they go to shows all around the world. And I can't tell you who it is because I don't want to get them in trouble with the other shows. But they, their comment was the Detroit North American International Auto Show has something special about it that the other shows just don't have. And we were trying to talk about it because we were like, well, okay, tell us. We don't want to lose that formula. It's a secret right? sauce, yeah. Right, right. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the birthplace of the automobile. It's, it's a city that's had some difficulties that's coming back that I think the, the, the press really enjoys. Uh, I think it's having everything under one roof, uh, which really yeah. makes it easier to to absorb what the feel and theme of it is, mm -hmm. as opposed to different buildings. So I, I I don't know what the the secret sauce is, but it is a uh, celebration of everything automobile. What's the ballpark? I can't remember it. I get up too early in the morning, and it's too late in the day. Uh, what's the ballpark figure? The economic impact this show has year after year. Yeah, the number uh, we were told this year is four hundred twenty-five million. Four hundred and twenty-five million dollars. Super Bowl. Wow. A Super Bowl is like three hundred million. And so, think about it. Uh, five or six yeah. years ago, we had a hotel across the street that was boarded up. Right. Yeah. And if you think about, you know, <laughs> right. the symbolism good, good of that, um, you know, but I think it's a metaphor for what's going on not only in the city but the region and. Yeah. Uh, now, the sign lightage outside, and my daughter reports, almost blinds you when you come up Jefferson. Right? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I really think it is a symbol. Of, and I think, Paul, to your point, a source of great pride for the people in the entire region. Yeah. Um, you know, and one that we should never take for granted. We were fortunate enough, Paul, as you know, to be involved in the financing and the renovation of this great building. And, and what a great job they did. And it was really so did. important and so necessary, spearheaded by the Detroit Auto Dealers Association. Yep. And I tell people, if you haven't been down there, you, in a number of years, oh, yeah. you've got to go. It's yeah. not 
Yeah. The old Cobo Hall. No, it's Get not. Get down here and see it. But I, I think, Paul, that, that may be part of the secret sauce is that uh, this is one of the few shows in the world that's actually owned by the Auto Dealers Association in the, in the area. Is that right? It no, is. And, I didn't know it. Uh, so we bring a very independent look to it. It's, it other shows around the world are more manufacturer-centric or um, you know, government-centric. Uh, we really bring that passion of being individual entrepreneurs out there selling cars every yep. day. And, uh, and I think Rod Alberts, our executive director, and his staff do such an amazing job. Such an job, amazing job. Uh, that, that, that's all part of the secret sauce. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of pride in that, and all of that's well and good. And we talk about that internally, but for the folks that are coming here to this show, understand this. Because of what we do for a living, most of us have been to the other shows around the world. You'd expect us as homers to say, well, this is the best one. Let me tell you one of the reasons why this is the best one. Not just because uh, over 5,000 international media people come here. That's a big deal for us internally uh, behind the scenes. The fact that there are more reveals here than anywhere else. That's a big deal for us, for the media, and for the uh, automotive industry, and certainly for the folks that come here. But let me explain. When you come to this new Kobo Center and see this new 2016 North American International Auto Show, you're seeing a spectacular show that's easily maneuvered. You can get around all over this show very easily. And for a guy who's had to go to, to I think Frankfurt, is Frankfurt the one that's the most spread out? Yeah. Where's Link? Who tell, buildings. It's Multiple like 11 buildings. buildings. It's, oh, wow. it's ridiculous. You walk miles to get from one end to the other, and it's you don't need to walk miles. You come here, and it's all right here. It's such a great show because it's so easily maneuvered and managed. That's what makes it extra special for the average person who doesn't really care uh, how it's going in the auto industry or anything else. Although in our, in our area, people have fingerprints all over these cars, and I don't mean the ones that, that, that the guys are trying to clean off right now as we speak. I'm talking about family members, friends, or themselves have had a hand in building these right. cars, and that's exciting. But the fact is... It's easy to get around. And let me tell you something else. It's going to sound ridiculous. Because of the safety rules in America, it's safe to get around. I'm telling you, you go to the, some of these auto shows in other countries, they have none of the rules and regulations. You can step off of a, a, an area or fall off an area that you didn't even know was there because they're allowed to do things without any regulation. That sounds like a personal uh, problem. Though, no, I never did. No, I okay. had right. another falling sure. issue. Yeah. No, yeah. no I, I bet you really have to be careful because... Uh, you can stumble, and then all of a sudden, you have a better appreciation for all the ridiculous sometimes rules and regulations that actually, in an application like this, make sense, because then all the stands are safe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, there's no doubt about that. We, uh, if I was wondering, Paul, if we could maybe switch gears, it, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about electric vehicles and so forth. And, you know, I've said a couple of times to people that I feel like some, in a way we're in an arms race, we being Detroit, Ann Arbor, with Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, Silicon Valley, if you go there, they'll tell you, Detroit, I mean, we're going to win this, right? But um, with that said, um, thoughts, comments, um, kind of, Sam, from your perspective in the dealership, but then, uh, you know, we talk about CAFE a lot and, you know, and, and so forth, but uh, maybe starting with you, Mike, what any thoughts about that? Because yeah. it gets a lot of conversation, right? Uh, no and doubt, no autonomous doubt. Autonomous vehicles. Especially autonomous. now with autonomous vehicles and with the electric vehicles, you see, you know, a lot of the West Coast talk, the Silicon Valley talk, you know, what, is Apple going to jump into the automotive, yeah. auto business? You know, what's going on with Tesla and Faraday Future and some of the other new new players that are out there? I will say... Detroit, Michigan is, is holding their own in this space in terms of investing in the technology and the research. Now, I will say on that end, going forward, when we start thinking about the deployment of electric vehicles or pure electric vehicles, it's still a tough slog. I mean, again, yeah. with $2 gas and, and the product, the compelling product that's out here and the developments that are still to be made yet on battery technology, we still have some room to, to grow into that. And it's coming. I mean, there are new developments every every day, it seems like. On the, on the battery front. So we're going to see more electric vehicles, more electrified vehicles. But in the meantime, we've got, and you see it at the show right now, more direct injection, turbocharging, and all sorts of additional content in the good old trusty internal combustion engine. And that's our bridge. So that, in some of these hybrid vehicles, stop-start technology, that's our bridge to getting towards full electric, eventually fuel cell vehicles as well. And the, the good thing, I would say, is the investments that Michigan State of Michigan's making into the into the business, educational institutions, Ann Arbor, out in Ann Arbor and so forth, 
that are focusing in on this as well, in addition to suppliers and automakers, is helping us. I think yeah. helping our battle, if we were going to frame it like that, with Silicon Valley. But I, at the end of the day, I think it's going to be very collaborative, even with Silicon Valley. I think yeah. it has to be. And I think, you know, Sam's story earlier, of those engineers that designed the Buick, Paul, if we could just get those young folks and take them over to every engineering school in the state right, of Michigan and right. say, look, this is Absolutely. a pretty cool business it's to exciting. be in. It's exciting. Yeah. It's a you great know? business yeah. to be in. And uh, But, uh, you know, the whole uh, autonomous, you get a lot in the showroom, Sam, do you get a lot of questions on that or not really? Uh, uh, not, not so much on people who are buying cars today. But there, there's there's talk about it, but not nobody walks in and says, I want to buy an autonomous car. That right. just isn't a reality yet. Um, <clears throat> but I think you're seeing things in collaborative uh, is I think where we're where we're going. I think you're seeing things that are more and more autonomous, but we retain some of the control. Mm -hmm. So, for example, adapt, adaptive cruise control. It's phenomenal. If you've ever driven Definitely. a car with it, you'll love it. Uh, I call it the marriage saver because I'm the guy who, if I get the cruise <laughs> control on, I don't want to take it off, and so I'll go real close <laughs> to this guy. And, let the, and so now the car just does it seamlessly, and I don't have to feel like I put the brakes on. It's right. great. Uh, but that's essentially an <laughs> autonomous vehicle, right? Yeah. It's it's autonomous for the time period that you want it to be, and then when you're ready to go off and you know go up up north for the weekend where you don't know, have the right technology in the roads, then you can do that. I so, can see Annie yeah. hitting the yeah. imaginary brake pedal in oh, the yeah. passenger yeah, well, side while you're. Why, this is why driving. I get a new demo every few thousand miles because they don't want the, the, the floor. <laughs> that's standard floor. equipment in my car. I'm <laughs> yeah, <sure>. yeah. <laughs> that second brake is yeah. very it helpful. Is. It is. There's amazing uh, technology. Uh, here now and on the horizon, a quick check, Mike, on the, the outlook for the suppliers, the people who are yeah. uh, partners in this and very important partners. You know, I, I think the outlook is actually st quite robust. I mean, we talk about some of the international pressures, and, and, they, and they have to be focused on that, no doubt. Um, but we talk a little bit about the technology, even the autonomous vehicle technology. I'm, I firmly believe that the real opportunity, especially over these next maybe five, six, seven years, is going to be with the suppliers and the different pieces and parts. Because we talk about lane departure warning, obstacle detection, blind spot monitoring, adaptive crews. There's a, there are a whole host of suppliers that are either in that business or getting into that business. Uh, and it's not just that. When you're talking about suppliers, if a supplier can come in and pull weight out of a vehicle, that's like gold to an automaker because that helps them get them closer to that cat. That was number. last year's word for the auto show, yeah. lightning. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Right, right. It really was. And it's still out there. It may not, you don't hear about it necessarily as much, although it's been around with some of the reveals. It's still there, and it's still critically important. And all suppliers can benefit from it that. seems like GM is really really caught up on lightweighting their sedans as Come a well, long right? way. And yeah. Well, the new Acadia is 700 pounds lighter yeah. than the That's than amazing. The Absolutely. That's, uh, that's a lot. That's a yeah, lot sure. of a weight. Lot. A lot of weight to find. Yep. And with all of that, uh, Sam, uh, all of this impacts what you do uh, on the front line as an auto dealer, including, I would think, uh, some pretty uh, significant training for your employees. In fact, some dealers now have people who specialize. It used to be the salesman. We'd say, well, how do we do this and how do we do that? Now, instead of taking them off the sales floor while they try to teach the technology, some dealerships have actually people on the floor that will teach that technology. Is that oh, something absolutely. that you're finding a lot yeah. of? We, we call it the tech doctor, and uh, <laughs> it's on our kiosk on the, show, on the showroom floor, but also, more importantly, in the service drive. Because what happens is, you know, you take a delivery of your car, you're all excited, you go home, and two days later you want to turn on the you gizwatch and you don't know what to do, right? To, so, yes. uh, so how do I sync my Bluetooth? Or the, the, the technology really has, has made training and having that information available to customers because they're going to forget. And that's so important. You can admit it's kind of a generational thing as well. And, you know, and I, I agree with Paul 100%. You know, you get home and you're like, and I'll get that. Were, weren't you listening? And I'm like, I stopped at the when my phone was synced up, right? Yeah, right. But it's funny because I've valeted my car and I come out and my dashboard looks different. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and right. you're like, how'd that, how'd that happen? happen? Those kids are pressing yeah. different buttons yeah. and they think they're helping us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're not. Well, what, I, what I find is usually I can tell, I can tell the, the kind of music I was listening to before I parked at Ballet because yeah. if it's good music to them, Wait a minute, I gave that up. Ballet guy a buck to put on 760 on the AM <laughs> dial, WJR. No, Wait a minute. It, but if, it's, if, I'm, if I'm blasting classical music, they just turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good way to protect yourself so they don't mess with it. That's right. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Mike Wall, Director of Automotive Analysis, IHS Automotive. Kind of a, a regular spot for us now every year. And, and as Rick said, we look forward to that. And we congratulate Sam Slaughter, uh, Vice Chairman of the 2016 North American International Auto Show. 
And, of course, the proprietor of Sellers Bowman Auto Group, which is Sellers Buick GMC in Farmington Hills, Bowman Chevrolet in Clarkston, and new Sellers Subaru in Macomb Township. And I'll give my partner, Rick DeVore, Regional Vice President, PNC Bank, the final word. Well, you know, Paul, this is Detroit. I mean, you know, when you think about the auto show, it is Detroit. And I just want to encourage everybody that listens to our show to really think about coming down. If you've been on the fence, boy, you got to get down here. It's just an amazing array of vehicles, and it's a, it's really a great time to be in Detroit. It, it really is. is. It is. It, and this is not hype. Believe me, this uh, place deserves all of the praise we've been giving it and will continue to give it. I'll look forward to speaking to you in my regular shift, the mornings, 5.30 till 9 on News Talk 760 on WJR. For Rick DeVore, Regional Vice President, PNC Bank, and the PNC Roundtable, regards, Paul W. Smith.